Well, Alex, welcome to the show. Thanks for making time for this. Of course, man. Thank you for having me. Well, for we we, uh, we watched some of your videos uh, for the past 15 minutes or so to kind of introduce everybody uh, in the audience to what you do. But for anybody who may not be familiar with uh, with your work or who's watching this after the fact, uh, tell us a little bit about yourself and what you do. Uh, well, I'm I'm a musician slash producer, I, I guess. Um, I think my main title by now would be uh, YouTube youtuber i guess youtube personality youtubist oh youtube <laughs> i kind of like that actually uh, guitar yeah, so and youtubist i uh i i uh take songs and turn turn them into different genres basically uh that's kind of the short way to to look at it uh they're always more um if i had to call them something they would be uh an arrangement experiment i like that well, there's a lot of things I want to dig into. I want, I want to talk about the arrangement thing later because I think arrangement is a really underrated, underappreciated part of music, you know, mm -hmm. especially if, especially for like guitarists who just talk, think about riffs. Um, but arrangement is a thing that people don't talk about or think about nearly much, in my opinion. So I want to talk about that later. But okay. um, so from what I understand, and correct me if any of this is wrong, uh, you turned you went full time with this fairly recently. Is that right? I'm working on it. I, I officially quit my job. Yes. Okay. Well, uh, then, then you're doing it. it. It it turns out that my job is specifically hard to find a replacement for. So I, I, I was like, I'll quit. But when you need me, I'll just hop in there a couple hours a week just to get you floating by while you fill the position. So you're still friends with benefits with your ex. <laughs> I, I, I was like hyper aware to try to leave it on good terms as good as possible to you know kind of make the transition like on me uh but yes yes i it was a big moment where i was able to say i can confidently project that i will no longer need this income from this job anymore uh so yeah that was kind of a big moment that's amazing so i, I saw your instagram announcement for it and you said like this is my chance to be the artist instead of the the person behind the scenes what what exactly were you doing before uh i was the technical supervisor of a uh, performance uh, performing arts center basically uh, but it's it, it was more like a roadhouse where you just have tours come through um, we never really presented anything like from any in-house um, how do you say that we just kind of hosted other people um, so I was basically like in charge of setting up concerts every night um, I was you know over logistics of of hiring the PA, hiring the whatever backline. Um, and so I've been, I've just been inundated with music and I've been around music in a professional capacity uh, for several years. And I just, um, I, it, it wasn't my calling. Like it was close enough, right. To, to like say, Oh, I'm, I'm making it in music asterisk. Yeah. Um, but, um, but yeah, I, it, it I've always kind of wanted to, transition to where, more where my passion is which is content creation and, and music well you've been doing youtube for from what i can tell like 10 years or something in some capacity um what would that was it ever the plan to make that your full-time gig or did that just sort of develop or tell me tell me about that well i had like grand plans after graduating college to open a recording studio somewhere somehow didn't have the details so I, you know, I got a friend to make me a logo. I made like a website on Squarespace or whatever. And I was, I was trying to think, all right, I need to demonstrate to people. I need a portfolio, right? If I'm going to mm -hmm. be a recording studio or a producer. So I'm like, okay, well, let me, let me just kind of record myself as like a demo reel. Um, and uh, I, I started gathering equipment materials to do that. And uh you know, I had, I had a little bit of a background in, in like producing and stuff in college. Uh, the, the, the degree that I had had several classes of that kind of thing baked into it. So, uh, you know, I thought I could do something out there, you know how it is. Um, and so YouTube was going to be my demo reel. Uh, even the channel name, uh, was, was the old studio title until, you know, like, I don't know, half a decade ago, YouTube did that thing where they, right switch the channel name formats or whatever but uh yeah 
I, and so I, that very first video, the Taylor Swift one that I think you played that one, mm -hmm. um, that was just me in my parents' house in a spare bedroom, you know, like I, I was like, okay, let's just see, I'll do something flashy and see if people notice it and then I'll get some clients. Uh, that did not end up working out that way, but, uh, I think tell me, tell me about that because this, that was really well done. Um, why do you think you didn't get clients? Oh, well, probably because I'm in a small town in South Carolina. <laughs> um, you know, back then, I mean, uh, I don't know. This tech stuff has come a long way and maybe you could produce a band uh, on, on like via zoom, but you could people never, do it. Like, yeah. I, like, it doesn't sound very fun to me, but people definitely yeah. do it. Yeah. Out of necessity, I suppose it has, it has to happen, but uh, back then, you know, especially back then it was like, okay, what's the local recording studio that we're going to go to? Maybe you drive, make a, make a road trip out of it for like three or four hours or something. But yeah. Uh, so yeah, absolutely. Uh, I just was, I, the marketing was fine, I guess, but the location, which is way more important, uh, was, yeah, it's just a non-starter pretty much. I mean, once you get established and people w are willing to come to you, then you can be wherever you want, you know? If, yeah, if you're the point. hottest thing in country, you could, you know, or whatever genre, then you can be in bumfuck South Carolina. Nobody's going to care. But if you're just starting out, it's a little tougher or, you know, or, or you're going to get clients, but they're going to be hot, awful, like local rappers that want to pay $25 or something, you know, yeah. but you got a studio, I'll be there in half an hour. Like, uh, <laughs> it's not really how this works, but <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. And so it's, it, it's interesting. I think so many of these creative careers take, a very winding path where you think you're going to be doing X and then you end up doing something totally different. That's cool. But you know, and in the moment it feels like a failure, I'm sure, but it's not. Yeah. I, I, I temperament wise and maturity wise and people wise, I was not ready to, to own a, a recording studio, mm -hmm. like the type of interpersonal things that you need to get good performances out of people. I did not have those skills like developed uh -huh. at all yet. So and dealing it's, with uh, artists all day is a whole other ball of wax. Yeah. yeah. A lot of people that quit producing for that reason because they're just tired of dealing with musicians all the time. I, I would not blame them. As someone who can say that they're, I, I'm kind of in both camps. Yeah, it, it, the artist part of me gets really annoying, I feel right. like. Hey, but you're, you're, you're the talent. You should refer to yourself as the talent. That's what I would do. Like if anyone challenged me, like, I'm the goddamn talent, all right? I've used that twice, both to make a, a, a ironic punchline joke of myself, but I, I, I don't think I have it in me to say it unironically. Yeah. Yeah. I would hope not. It's like when athletes talk about themselves in the third mm. person and, and say myself, you know, like myself feels like this is the best version of myself that uh, myself has ever seen. You know, this season myself is just really going to work on being the best Alex that myself can be. Myself did some things today that, you know, didn't work out, but myself's proud of, proud of what this team's can, are capable of. I'm already exhausted. Uh, yeah. So when did you decide to, it was a, uh, what you said, technical director? Yeah. Yeah. Just kind of the, the boss that's in charge of all the stage stuff. And when, when did you start doing that? And, you know, did that feel like a compromise or defeat to you or were you happy about it or how, how did you feel about that? Uh, it's, it's, I think I, well, my internship in college, which was in 2011, uh, that's when I first started working at that facility specifically, um, as an intern in school, then I graduated, started trying to do my own stuff. I came back and did freelance gigs for them. Like they would just per gig hire me. Um, and then, uh, the guy quit just like I did recently, except he did not, uh, really <laughs> facilitate a, a, a peaceful transfer of power. So, so he said, speak. fuck you, I'm out of here. Uh, and so, you know, they took their time, they, they vetted other people, but I was already kind of there. Uh, and so I ended up getting the job and that's been, you know, I've been there five years in that capacity and yeah, I, the whole time there are varying levels of like, my interest in things over a graph of time, like, and music mm -hmm. just kind of had dipped for a while because I was focused on trying to make a living. Music absolutely was not the way forward. It, you know, from, from my perspective, it was like, 
okay, so this, this isn't working immediately and wildly successfully. So therefore it's a failure. And, um, let me try to find a job in at least a field that I can be like around a guitar sometimes, you know? So would you, so in your mind, that job wasn't music, wasn't in music. Right. Yeah. It's a lot of more, it's more logistics, I suppose. (laughs) Got it. Even though it's logistics for music, like to to you, and I'm not, I mean, I'm not challenging this. I just want to understand what you're thinking. Cause I guess my, my, where I'm at here is like, I feel like I, I've been in the same place of, I feel like I, you know, I had this very, very specific idea of what I wanted to be doing. Like I used to sure. do graphic design and I wanted to be doing, you know, graphics in this particular kind of style for these kind of clients. And if it wasn't that, I, I felt like I wasn't going to be happy, you know? And I, and I feel like as creative people, you know, we really kind of, it's both good and bad. You know, you have a really, really specific vision of what you want to do and anything other than that just feels like it's not what you want. Yeah. And you know, at the end of the day, you have to make money to, to live. And so it's like, I don't know how, how close do you want to land on the, on the dartboard to something that's going to like, exactly make you happy versus make you money. But I, I and, then, and then sometimes, you know, for me, there's been a few times where I did end up doing what I wanted. Like for a couple of years I made, I worked on this DVD magazine. This one, obviously when DVDs were more of a thing, I did uh, stuff for like action sports and music stuff like skateboarding and, you know, surfing and snowboarding and then making, you know, inter- I mean, we interviewed like bands like under oath and stuff like that. And it was like, they were like legit companies and worked with Quicksilver and DC and element and stuff like that. So I got what I wanted, but I ended up hating it after a couple of years because working with people in action sports might be even worse than working with musicians. Uh, and I was working so hard for not that much money. And I was like, man, I got what I wanted, but it turns out the thing that I wanted actually doesn't make me that happy. Yeah. Can relate. Yeah. You know, it happens. So, uh, so you, you went full, well, you're, you're, you're basically full time a month into this. And how are you feeling about that so far? Happy, scared, both? Um, I, I knew, I knew the general error would be like, why did you, why did it take you so long to do this? Um, because I just feel like such a quality of life bump for some, I, I, you know, it's inevitable that if you have this eight hour chunk that's just ripped out of your day. Uh, and then, you know, for that, for the past year and a half or so, I've been doing like YouTube at a pretty large scale while working this job so i would go and to like work. the shit you do is not lightweight i mean these are like it requires you know, especially the audio part is legit i mean these are like legit recordings and i'm guessing you're recording and, and mixing all that stuff yourself well um up until recently uh i got hooked up with uh, tom denny from Don't oh okay Remember. yeah he, um he's, he's been great. mixing some of my stuff uh he was like i don't know i, I we got hooked up via my manager and he had already heard of me when my manager brought it, brought me up and I was like, Oh my God, that's, that's so wild that Tom didn't well, kind of look the same minus the tattoos. You know, I, I recently visited him in Florida and, um, even in person I could like, yeah, we're, we're kind of the same dude almost. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, so that, that was my thought is like, how do you find the time and energy to do the kind of stuff you were doing, which is very high quality shit. This is not, you know, some, kid in their bedroom this is like these are legit recordings how do you find the time and energy to do that when you have a full-time job uh right at the start of the pandemic something very specific on tiktok happened that kind of gave my channel like a little boost on youtube as well what Um, was that it was uh the the taylor swift love story challenge where that dance Mm. remix of the taylor swift love story uh, goes into the bridge and people push the camera away on some kind of wheels and they start doing this dance. Um, so I, I, I intercut the, uh, the remix of the song with my own pop punk version of the song and did it actually in the theater that I work at. And I had all these lights going. It was really cool looking. And I oh, kind of okay. went like semi viral and got like 4 million views. And then everybody was like, Ooh, where's the full version of this song? So then I, I went to work and I, I said, uh, hey, boss, I'm going to take the next two days off because something really awesome happened and I need to record a full version of this song now. And uh, he's like, 
All right, you got the vacation time. Go for it. We're kind of in the pandemic anyway. We're not doing shows. Right. Uh, and so I recorded that and I and a lot of people saw it and a lot of people liked it. And I put it on Spotify and a lot of people streamed it. And then I started getting uh, revenue sources that were new to me. And I kind of made a deal with myself. And I said, you know, if I can keep up the fact that I made more money from music this month, than my full-time job if i can oh, wow. do that if i can do that for one year one year straight no months dipping below then i will quit mm -hmm. and last month was the one year damn and that's was, no joke it was kind of a it was a challenge to myself to like it doesn't matter that you had to to like be at work all day and now you have dishes and you have chores and you have to cook dinner and you have to mm -hmm. figure, you have to make sure your girlfriend knows that you love her still and you're not trying to abandon her and then yeah. also find time to go record to keep up this this threshold for myself um it was just sheer sheer will willpower yeah. i think uh i i would not have been able to sustain that <laughs> Um, I think so. that's the way to do it. That's the way I've done it every time I've made some big transition like that in my life I've kept doing this thing, you know, I'm trying to find the camera here. I've kept doing this thing, you know, uh, I've got my full-time job until this thing kind of gets to a certain point. And then, then it's sort of a fairly straightforward decision, but man, it's fucking hard, but I think it's the way to do it. You know, quitting before you have the side, the side gig kind of to the point where it's proven that it's working. I mean, I guess if you want to do it, but most people I would say are not in the position where they can take that kind of a risk, you know? Um, exactly. I mean, if you're 19 and you live with your parents, I'd say, fuck it, you know, quit your job at GameStop and just fucking go for it. But if you're an adult, you know, with responsibilities and you know, you're married or have a boyfriend, girlfriend, whatever, uh, you know, it's hard for me to suggest that. And especially, I mean, if you're basically making double income, I'm guessing you were able to save, you know, a little bit of a, a rainy day fund and stuff to kind of de-risk things. Well, you know, a lot of it went to gear. I'm not going to. Uh-oh. <laughs> Which, you know. That new I, compressor, that's going to that's gonna fix everything, right? That's that's the trick. Oh, it only, it only yeah. sounds 5% better, and I spent 600 bucks on it. I'm not that deep in the rabbit hole, but uh, it, it's not far off, you know. When you start that, looking at preamps, that's when you know it's really bad. I think that is like a good, like this or that moment where you're just it, they they mean nothing to you and then one day you're like let's hmm, maybe they do something i don't know they definitely do something but whether they're worth 1200 bucks uh, I'm, I'm not so sure about but they definitely do something um yeah well, I, I was I, responsible though i did it the responsible way i i made sure that i was covering all my taxes you know because that's new when you start making yeah working for yourself or whatever it's like okay now i owe taxes instead of getting a little rebate kiss so, 20 to 30 percent of that goodbye yeah and so you know it, it became to the point where i i went to my parents and and i sat down and i said okay well like here's the plan here's all the information like you know i'm 31 but i still very much care about what my family thinks of my decisions. It's not like I mm -hmm. grew out of that, you know. So, and they, even they were like, you know what? I mean, it's really, really hard to argue with this case. So, mm -hmm. you know, even even some, you know, Southern middle-aged white folk sometimes agree that you need to just go for it, so. I mean, that's the way that I feel about YouTube sometimes, you know, is, uh. I feel silly saying it, but I mean, you know, I mean, it's like it helped us. We just were buying a house, closing on it next week. And mm. I mean, it's that's where the down payment for it came from, you know, and uh, it, it's it's sort of like this weird, I don't know, inferiority complex or something that I have where I feel like anything creative isn't like, I don't know is it can't be a real job or can't be real money or like, I just, you know what I mean? It's like, Oh, it's just a hobby or something. But I'm like, man, I'm making real money at this. I, I got to stop thinking that way. Like this is just a business. If, I, if yeah. someone was making this much money selling gravel or something, I'd be like, awesome. Good for you. Like nobody, like what's the difference? It doesn't matter where the money comes from. It's just a business. Yeah. I mean, you're, you're providing a service that people clearly want. Yeah. Well, I, I did have one question about that because so much of what you do is covers. Um, 
and you, I guess, need to, you know, pay royalties on that. How does that affect uh, your business in general, but specifically on YouTube? Well, I've I've never uploaded content that wasn't derivative in some form in that way in, in the copyright right way. So mm -hmm. I can't compare on like whether like, oh, you get more money doing vlogs versus cover. Right. I don't know. So this is like kind of my only experience with YouTube. And um, pretty early on in, in the pandemic is when this whole thing blew up and I started posting more and I would get claimed and, and I'm sitting here going, this is fair use. I know it For is. For the melody. Um, I think so. I think it yeah. was, it was the, the publishing companies that owned the song would, would, yeah. I think grab the melody or something like that. Yeah, not for not for the master because for anybody listening or watching, there's two sets of two sets of licenses that you need to work out. One is the master recording and one is the melody. So because you have a new recording of the song, you don't have to pay for that, but you do have to pay for the melody. Yeah, and so I they I I kept getting claimed and I and I thought in my head at the time like this is this is fair use. This shouldn't fall under anything they can claim. It turns out I was wrong about that. <laughs> yes, but you were. <laughs> the The only reason that I found out I was wrong about that is because a representative from an MCN reached out to me and they asked me, are you getting like copyright claims a lot? Because I think I had posted about it complaining. Yeah, that was in, I was within my fair legal yeah. right to, I don't know, steal these people's songs. Yeah. Uh, and so the guy was was basically like, well, if you sign with us, then we will take care of all that back end for you. We'll negotiate the splits. And because this is a fresh recording and, and you're only giving like writing credit, then you'll get yeah. like a pretty large majority of the, of that split. Mm -hmm. And so ever since I signed with them, I've been able to, you know, they get their percent yep. and then I've been able to like, uh, what's the word? Uh, reliably make money from mm -hmm. from my back catalog whereas before it was like a dice roll on whether right. the company would find it because it's not something you can scan for this is a manual claim right so they would just have to stumble upon it in searching for you know people to do this too i guess right got it okay that's cool i know lots of times people you know most of what you hear from mcns or you hear about mcns is that they don't really do anything and they're not worth it and blah 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 but in your case, it sounds like they really are providing a lot of value. So how, how does that work? Like you tell them, I'm going to do this cover. Can you negotiate this license for me? And then you do it, or do you record it? And then I like, what's the process there? Um, for me, the process is I take the MP3 of my cover. I upload it to a server on their website. Then they keep that scan it and now they can automatically find other youtube videos that use this sound uh so this is like here's my cover of so and so and okay, then they, yeah i got it they'll scan yeah. my video and now it's in their kind of domain yeah uh so it's kind of like you have to give them the material to reference right they put um, it in the content id database yes yeah and uh so that's kind of all that i have to worry about and so you don't, there's the split and all that stuff. It, like you don't, you don't talk to them about that. It, it's just taken care of for you. I, I probably should be more inquisitive yeah. <laughs> uh, about, you know, how all that works, but I've just been, I don't know. I, I think I'm a little green when it comes to, uh, industry stuff. So I don't know like what's fair, what's normal, right. you know, that kind of thing. So I, I believe somebody in the chat maybe can correct me, but I believe that when you do covers, I think it's a compulsory license. I think it's like eight cents per. There's a statute for this of like a compulsory license, like eight cents per mechanical. And I don't know what it means for YouTube, but I think there's a statute for covers, but I, I might hmm. be wrong about that. But that's cool. I'm glad to hear that the the MCN is actually helpful for you. Um I'm I'm also interested what what I've I found you on TikTok. I think for maybe I think you did like a Paramore cover or something that I found. And I thought it was really cool because I'm really interested in this y alternative thing. I don't know if you, if, if you're familiar with that and it doesn't seem like it's a huge thing, but it, it just, it feels like it needs to happen because there's so many kids or, I mean, not even kids at this point, but just so many people, you know, primarily people from the South, I think that grew up on both of those things on, you know, alternative music and country music. Cause they grew up around it and stuff. 
and country just never had a place. It's always been like the redheaded stepchild. It was just not welcome at the table at all. And it feels like now people are like, actually, like countries, country can be cool too. And it feels like that's starting to get more accepted. What are your kind of thoughts on all that? Well, whoever came up with the phrase is a genius and yes. it wasn't me, uh, unfortunately. Um, but I, 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 I come at my videos from a place of deep appreciation for the genre. Um, like it, it can be cheesy. Yeah. Uh, but it's, it's every genre can be cheesy. Great point. Every genre can be cheesy. And, and, you know, I just grew up listening to these songs that unironically had just like immaculate production immaculate musicianship i mean that's something that they're really big on it's like you know uh it, these guys can play like those people in nashville are the best in the fucking business like the yeah. producers the mixers the session players like it and, is fucking cutthroat because everyone is so fucking good yeah and and this is kind of where you know what I was saying earlier about these being arrangement exercises is I I'm, I'm going to try to take these riffs, motifs, melodies, uh, rhythms from this pop punk song and translate to to not just a country version of the song, but more deeper than that, what what country players would write given the reference material of the song. So it's like hmm. I'm not just ripping each lead line and going, all right, let's, let's put it on an acoustic guitar now and right. we'll do a double stop here. It's, it's maybe getting rid of that lead line entirely and coming up with something that would fit stylistically a little better, uh, with harmonies the same way, even sometimes, you know, you can adjust the melody. Uh, but you know, it's, it's, I guess specifically about the alternative thing. I feel like, I don't know what it stands for, what it means. Like, do people want to see original country music with this same lyricism or do people want the crossover thing with the covers or is it more, they want the uh, standard pop punk song, but maybe with the better instrumentals from a country session. Right. I, right. What, yeah. what, what is the market need there? That's a good question. I, I, that's a good question. I, I don't know the answer to that. Um, in a musical form, but I think culturally the need is to be like, Hey, it's okay. If you're a kid from the South who also likes, you know, Alan Jackson or whatever, like you don't have to hide that. It's okay. We, you know, Alan Jackson's cool. Paramore's cool. It's all good. Yeah. It's okay. But, so but I think that's a great question musically. Like could somebody could, could an original country artist come out and play to the alternative scene? You know, uh, that I think is a tall order, <laughs> um, but never say never, you know, I mean, it could happen. Yeah. I, 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 I don't know where this thing is headed yet, but I just, I'm just feeling like it's a thing, you know, I think, I think you hit it on the head when you said culturally, I think it's more that than what I was trying to ask about, <laughs> because that's, that's just how I think it's like, okay, so like musically what's going on here, but more, but, but that's a good, but that's the, the question is like, all right, well, what is that? What shape does that take musically? I don't know the you know you would know the answer to that better than I do. You're you're the musician. Like I, you know, the other day I wondered like, what if I just wrote a straight up country song and put it on my channel, an original? Like, would anybody care? Is that not why they're there? Probably not why they're there. But um, yeah, it's interesting. I think it's more about the novelty of the cover at this point. Yeah, yeah. I think it's 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 kind of the same thing as um, you remember all the punk goes pop uh albums right where people cover whatever kesha or miley cyrus or something and it was sort of like giving them permission to like a pop song because for whatever reason there's this bizarre stigma in the rock scene that like pop isn't real music or whatever which of course is ridiculous because actually it is some of the you know highest quality music on the planet and so is pop country i mean these are the best fucking like these are people who get paid millions and millions of dollars to write extremely catchy songs because they are so good at it that they yep. can command that kind of a price um and i think people don't i think people are very misguided about the musicianship in these genres too like the people who play on these records 
are god tier musicians that sometimes get like an hour notice you know they're like yeah you know like uh yeah, yeah. yeah alex the uh can you come in the the drummer on this isn't isn't working out uh we, we we need to be done by tomorrow can you come in and play the drums on this you know and they email you an mp3 and you listen to it three times on the way to the studio and then you play it in one fucking take and you're gone like that's that's the level that these pop people are at yeah. these nashville people are at you know the kind of people that can just sit in on a song and play a solo they just tell me what key it is and we'll just go and they'll nail it on the first fucking take um which is nobody in fucking rock can do that shit you know yeah yeah that's it's that's the funny thing about it is like all the stuff that i do on my channel that's pop punk f focused is is quite easy instrumentally like that's yeah. not where the challenge lies uh it's more like getting nailing the production and and trying to you know like that kind of stuff but uh yeah it, it's bands like pine grove i think are very special to me because um i don't know they seem to live in alternative spaces but they have a very full like folk punk indie country ish it's very complicated and it's uh you know speaking of musicians those dudes can play uh with so much feeling and dynamics i'm not that familiar. i I've, i know their name but i'm not familiar with them i'll have to check it out and and i i feel like that's kind of the the blueprint for me is like when i can come at this and really like put my heart in a song and have all these cool layered parts and uh we're not stuck in you know power chord land right um and you can kind of nothing wrong with power chord land obviously because that's kind of where i live yeah. and where i've lived my whole childhood but uh you know it's nice to see certain bands bring in more technical things whether that's songwriting whether that's uh li literal parts or you know i don't know i i like yeah. to see the genre lines blur well, uh, we'll take some questions on chat in a minute, if that's cool with you. Before we do that, uh, while well, everyone's getting getting their questions, so get your questions ready if you're watching live. Um, before we do that, I wanted to talk about arrangement a little bit, because that's something that I feel like is super underutilized and just really not ever even considered <laughs> in a lot of the rock world. Mm. Um can you can you talk about what arrangement is and why it's such a powerful songwriting tool as opposed to like adding another riff which is what a lot of people i think do uh for me specifically arranging in pro tools uh feels almost like uh it takes a lot of the shoulders off of a lot of the load off the shoulders of mixing mm -hmm. uh if if you lay out the song and arrange it how it should be arranged the mixing is almost just making sure certain things are are tweaked and adding a bunch of compression but like so what we you, what would be an example of of something like that that you've done just so that people know what you're talking about yeah and it, like the chorus of a song i will take the guitar part and play like the chords and i'll pan it hard left i'll do another take play the chords pan it hard right i'll do like this little like kind of high pitch little twinkly thing in the key and that'll go like pan 50 percent. then i'll do this little octave run thing that'll pan another 50 percent. then maybe one more in the middle and then a bass but then in the verse i'll just like take those two panned tracks from the beginning of this and now those are the only two guitars that are left in the verse right so you had all this build up of stuff this wall of sound and then you're moving into the verse and you're not having to like mix it lower it's just naturally more sparse it's just less stuff less energetic and so that's kind of the way i just build sections like that and so maybe like section verse 1a is like almost nothing just maybe with like bass guitar and then 1b you bring in this little lead thing and then by the pre-chorus you're you got your chugs panned out and then by the time everything's in you know so it's the same basic people would say the same riff, the same basic musical idea, but you've added this stuff to create progression and dynamics throughout the song without yeah. having to add another part. Yeah. Yeah. And it, it, it takes, I think it takes a, a certain kind of ear to know just immediately like what, what needs to happen. And I think that's, if you want to say that I'm good at anything at all, 
I'm, I think my brain works best for the process of arranging. Like that's what I think makes my stuff what it is. The fact you know that what I, I what I want to do here on Twitch one of these days is uh, an exercise that a friend of mine who is probably the best musician I know, Al Levy, he went to Berkeley and he's a super talented guy. Um, he gave me this exercise of taking a song that you like and writing down bar by bar what's happening. Mm. And uh, it takes a long time. Like it take you a couple hours to get through a three minute song if it's a detailed arrangement. But I did that and it made I'm not anywhere near as good at songwriting or anything as you are, but it made me literally 10 times better in like a couple weeks because it just made me aware of all these things that I never heard before. Like, for example, one of my favorite arrangements uh, is uh, TJF by Katy Perry because mm. it's the same four bar loop the entire song, but it doesn't feel like it when you're mm. listening to it because they're always the, the arrangement changes all the time or Anaconda by Nicki Minaj same thing there's so much like subtle uh automation and panning and stuff like that going on that it's again it's the same loop the whole song but you don't think about it that way um just dance by lady gaga is another one of my favorites it's not the same loop but it's the same chord progression mm. the whole song but they just change it up and arpeggiate it and stuff like this and and until i until i mapped the song out i was like oh it's the same fucking chord progression pro progression the entire fucking song that part yep. that's that that I thought was different, it's just an mm -hmm. arpeggiation of the same progression. And that's why the song feels dynamic and interesting and it feels like there's movement, but it all it, it it's all consistent and cohesive. It all holds together because it's the same idea, just theme and variation on the same basic idea. And it, it's just it kind of it's a pet peeve of mine that so many rock bands, especially like metal bands, don't I, I don't think they think about arrangement at all, really. And it is harder in metal because there's a lot more going on, but there's always something you can do. And it just feels like they don't even think about arrangement at all. And it really hurts the songs. Yeah. I, I, those examples you gave are, are really, yeah, those are like really great examples of, of how you, you, that when I discovered I could play, I could play the same thing in the verse as I do the chorus. Like, right. That sometimes that works. Sometimes that yeah. is legitimately the best answer. And then, like you said, it's a, it's a testament to the arrangement process that they don't feel like the same thing. You know, there's, like you said, there's so many things you can tweak, so many things you can, uh, you know, duck something out and have it come back in, add a new part. Uh, even uh, to the point of when I track songs, you know, most of the time people, will copy and paste chorus parts right uh for certain instruments i will and for like you know background vocals and stuff but like for like drums lead vocals and certain guitars like i feel like i just need to record everything mm -hmm. like i can't i can't have it be the same exact guitar riff because it won't the be second. the same it'll be a little bit different so exactly. if you're just listening to the vocal when you know let's say it's a female vocalist that's really belting you're going to play that part a little bit differently. Yeah. And you, know, and even you just will st st stuff as subtle as that, like a different little rhythm or something in, in heavy music can even go really far just to like make a moment stick out in somebody's mind. And you're right. I think maybe there's just not the, the culture is not one for experimenting or something. It's who but I mean, even something as simple as like, what if for this verse you play it on the ride instead of the hi-hat just a little thing like that mm -hmm. can make a massive difference and it could it'll feel like a totally different part yeah absolutely well let's uh i could go on about this forever but let's take some questions in the chat um let's combine sludge and gospel what a challenge that's a good challenge okay so yeah questions drop some questions in the chat here here's one uh, hey, Alex, have any of the original artists you've covered reached out to you with any feedback or comments? Any cool stories about that? Um, you know, I, it's very few of the artists actually like go out of their way to do anything about it. Uh, probably because they don't see it most of the time. But I, Mark Hoppus did uh, tweet about me two different times. Oh, wow. And that's like, that's the only one you need really. <laughs> yeah, really. Like, exactly. Uh, what a great dude. And uh, I think he, I assume he liked it. Yeah, he was actually, it was, um, it was the, I miss you country cover. I did, I think is, is, was, was one of them. And he, 
he said this has been brought to my attention and then he just posted the link i guess maybe just to tell people like stop sending me this i see i've seen it <laughs> but then like in a reply that's cool he, though too that just people were that excited about it that they punished him with it <laughs> they punished him <laughs> yeah uh, that's awesome and, uh, more recently i i ran into um frank uh from sum 41 uh the, the their drummer that they have now um and uh he was he like he like recognized me after a while we were in a venue together and i said hey and he's like hey man and then he came up to me afterwards he was like dude i didn't realize who you were at the time but me and me and the guys in the band watch your videos all the time we think it's hilarious and uh so that was really cool to like hear yeah. like, that like the band dudes are are actually seeing this <laughs> yeah that's super cool uh, another one here. I noticed a Dave Days comment on one of your videos. Was that also a cool moment for you? you know, I, I somehow completely missed his whole thing. Uh, I'm, I wasn't really familiar until recently where, uh, you know, he, I think he did comment on something and then I, I saw who he was and I was like, oh my God, that's, that's incredible. He seemed like this, like almost the godfather of, of what I'm doing now on YouTube. He did, you know, before, before I even had a channel almost. So, um, yeah, it's, it's I, crazy I to think that, you know, you get millions of views, but I still am surprised when anybody sees my videos, but I mean, I shouldn't be, you shouldn't be, but it, it's always just a surprise, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, who is your biggest musical inspiration? Uh, I'd have to say, uh, obviously Blink-182. Um, more recently, I feel disconnected from their current stuff a little bit. Um, but yeah, the three, the three big albums, Anima, Take Off Your Pants and Jacket, and Untitled, that's basically like my entire crash course in pop punk. So you're not an early Blink snob like some of those people that think... You fucking Dude Ranch and uh, Cheshire Cat are the best. It's charming and it's catchy and it's good, but it's just not as artistically fulfilling for me. I think if they had recorded it with Travis at a better studio, I, I would be interested to hear what that sounded like. But I think Scott is just a really limited drummer and the, you know, especially yeah. as they would admit, Tom and Mark could barely play back then. Yeah, maybe maybe they were all three on par at the time. <laughs> yeah, probably so. Um, how do you deal with all the hate people are giving you for covering these popular bands and songs? They're all great, by the way. Screw the haters. I've never really gotten a concentrated amount of hate, except for when I covered Slipknot. Oh, That's shocking. The, the metal fans were assholes. How, how surprising. That's the one where everybody else is like, Oh my God, this is one of my favorite songs growing up. It's really cool to hear it in this fresh way. It's like, I already knew it as I was listening. That's a, you know, a, everybody always appreciates it. It's always like a, Oh, thank you for taking me on this trip through the familiar, but unknown at the same time. It's always really fun, except for people more recently. I think they, they found the Slipknot cover through a couple of people on TikTok. Uh, and everybody has just been constantly, I probably get, a couple hundred like messages on that TikTok per day going like Fuck you. delete this, apologize, get this off of my page. Like all this stuff that's just like you can just just keep on welcome going. to my world. Uh, it's exhausting. And just that light, tiny little bit of it is like really <laughs> annoyed me recently. But you know, what can you do? This it's it's weird, it. you know, there there are buttholes in any genre of music, but you don't get this shit from pop punk kids. You know, there's a few of them, but right. Not not like metal. Metal is just uniquely cancerous. It must be removed. We must remove the cancer. Yeah, he's like, um, he's like. a, a couple a couple questions basically along the lines of, you know, if there's anybody that you could work with, put together a super group or anything like that, who are the people that you would love to work with uh in your dream world yeah um man i would say who am i a big fan of i feel like the guys in four years strong are like dan and alan are really like incredible guitar players um i would love to write with them just to see what they come up with and and their their style is really like 
it seems very interconnected, like very intricate. Um, man, I feel like the drummer from the story so far is like a super underrated drummer. That dude is, I don't know, he seems like he's real solid. Nothing super flashy or technical, but always cool and creative. Yes, absolutely. Um, I feel like, I don't know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm saying like all kind of newer, newer pop punk. I don't know. I, I think I think those are my answers. I don't, I don't want to say any of the heroes from my childhood or anything. <laughs> sure. Okay. Well, a uh, couple more questions here before I let you go. Um, when you got the idea to mix, the, when you got the idea to mix genres the way that you do, was someone else influential to him in figuring it out? So basically, like, is there anybody else where you were like, oh, they're mixing genres in a cool may way? Maybe I'll do that, or did you just kind of come up with that out of thin air? Uh, I was a huge, huge fan of the Our Last Night covers back when they first started doing that. Uh, like the first round where it was like radio pop songs back in like twenty. But you were doing that. Maybe even before they did, though, right? Uh, I remember listening to them in college. I think it was... They were doing it like 2013-ish or something. Okay. So we might have started right about the same yeah. time. I probably saw one of their videos and was like, I want to try. Yeah. Uh, you know, they, they're they smart about it. They don't... You know, they 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 have really good arrangement skills. I think that's the, the guy from that band, Matt. Mm -hmm. I think I would call him, you know, really gifted in that in that specific yep. he records and mixes all their stuff too uh yeah he's he's a monster but um yeah i and obviously the occasional thing would pop up on youtube uh, and go viral for some kind of genre bending thing but it, nothing that i really like followed or subscribed to as much as our last night stuff yeah and as far as the country stuff goes uh it turns out there was a guy that that did uh, emo and pop pop punk country covers before I did, uh, and he kind of had deleted his channel for a while, but I think he's back now. He goes by the name of Secret Tree Fort, uh, and he did kind of like, you know, I think he did Blink Song, he did Hawthorne Heights or something, and he's got a really solid voice, and um, it, they were good, so like they were good covers, uh, but I I didn't know about them, and so the, I first started posting like that Panic cover as a country song, and people were like. Oh, this is just secret tree fort. And I'm like, who? And so I had to go look it up and I'm like, oh, well, I mean, technically. You're like, technically okay, he they're right. It is. But I didn't know that. Not yeah. on purpose. And so, you know, then you get in a whole thing about like the idea premise seems to have lost all sense of ownership, especially with like things like TikTok. People just do the same joke, right. the same premise of things. And it doesn't really seem to be a problem. Obviously, even with the pop punk stuff, it's not like I invented that concept of video. So I don't see why it would translate to say I stole his his thing when. Well, there's there's people that are so just weirdly obsessed with who did it first and accusing everyone else of being a ripoff. Like, oh, well, yeah, I didn't remember. It's not the first band that played pop punk mm. breakdowns. They didn't invent that. And like, all right, who gives a fuck? Who said they did? They did it well, though. So, yeah, I like. Why are you so fixated on it? Like literally nobody gives a fuck who did it first. Such a irritating. It's just these fucking nerds. That's all it is. Nerds. Nerds. I'm going to go bully some, I'm gonna go bully some nerds. That's what I'm going to do. All right. Well, I'll let you go. Um, I heard that it's your anniversary, so you should probably go um, do anniversary things instead of being on, on Zoom with me. Um, but thank you very much. Uh, uh, any words of wisdom or advice or anything else you want to uh, add before I let you go? Uh, people can do uh, covers in the same way that I do them. I don't claim any type of intellectual property over anything I've done. So please fill the internet with more <laughs> things that you love to make. Um, and yeah, thanks for having me. It's great to meet you. Uh, we'll stay in touch. Awesome. Talk to you later and happy anniversary.